Welcome back. Uh, it's a very good morning. I hope it stays the same way for the next uh, couple of hours. Uh, so what we are going to do today is uh, one of the very important topics. Uh, also conceptually, it is supposed to be uh, from whatever feedback I have obtained from the students and even from my own student days, uh, this is one of the more involved topics in engineering mechanics. Not that it is extremely difficult or anything, but essentially systems or engineering mechanical systems, okay, which have frictions between their contacts. Because so far, when we did 2D equilibrium, when Chobik taught 3D equilibrium, we did trusses, there was no mention of any friction. Everywhere we were said that assume that the contacts are frictionless, assume that the surface is smooth, and so their friction was almost thrown away. But what we know is that in real life, Friction is always there. Sometimes it's create havoc. The way it creates havoc is, for example, if you have friction in your car engines, friction in fans, friction in vehicles, friction in uh, all moving objects, okay, or on your shoes, what they do is that friction causes damage. Damage uh, in the form of deterioration, extreme heat, and so on. But at the same time, we also know that friction is extremely important. For example, the fact that I could walk here on this stage is because there is a friction between my sandals and the stage. Similarly, you can sit so nicely on these chairs clearly because of the friction. Just try wearing silk and sitting on a wooden chair. Okay, then you will realize what I am trying to say. Uh, similarly, okay, you are holding your pens. The fact that you could hold your pens clearly is because of friction. Okay, try holding a soap when it is wet. Okay, you will see. Okay, it doesn't stay in your hands. So it is essentially friction. What it does is that that even, okay. It causes a lot of damage, a lot of deterioration, a lot of heat, okay, wastage. Okay? At the same time, we need it okay, essentially to survive. Okay? Otherwise, any day-to-day -day activity becomes extremely difficult. For example, if uh, you are training some students here, you will see that, for example, there is a strategy. Like there is a question. Okay, it's a very pet question of physicists. They ask you that if, for example, you are trapped on uh, uh, on a frozen lake, okay, those frozen lakes we don't see in most parts of the country, but in uh, North India, especially Kashmir, okay, you can see that, for example, lakes are frozen, and if you are trapped in the middle of a frozen lake, how do you get out? There is no friction to get out. Then they say, okay, there are some rocks and pebbles around. Then the strategy is that because you don't have friction, you throw them in the opposite direction and try to move forward. Okay, but the idea, the point that I'm trying to make is the presence of friction, which we take for granted, makes our life extremely easy. So what we are going to do in this is that we are going to discuss a few problems, okay? That if an engineering mechanical system has frictions either internally or at the contacts, then what happens? How do we attempt those problems? Can we say what is the uh, can we say anything about the stability of the system? Okay, can we say when the system will collapse, when it will mechanically not be stable, and so on? Those will be the topics. And there are a few strategies. There are reasonably easy strategies. And especially I remember that when I was a student. We always used to have this query that there used to be these rumors flying around. Okay, when I use rumors, is because the day before the exam, all students will be studying one problem or the other, and like one, so I solve it in this way. Then somebody says I solve it in this way. Then they, there is a rumor that I heard that apparently friction ka sign should not be taken in some certain direction. Okay, so what I realize, what I'm just trying to say is that that it can cause a lot of uh, uh, solving those problems can be a bit challenging. But what I'm trying to say is that at over the last few years, talking to various people, getting feedback from the students, we have some kind of a reasonable strategy. In fact, almost some kind of classification as to how to solve those problems. And what I'm going to do today is share those ideas with you. Of course, as an engineering mechanics, sharing of ideas is essentially done by solving problems. So we'll solve problems, share ideas, okay? And towards the end of the class, if you have some additional ideas or feedbacks, you can come forward, okay? and discuss them okay, with the entire community. Only thing is that a request is only questions in the, uh, when I'm talking, okay, when I'm done, okay, then you can come forward and give your suggestion. Okay, this is just in the interest because we have limited time, okay, and everyone wants to um, be on board. Okay, so if you have any suggestions, only towards the end of the class, any questions, always welcome, even in the middle. 
Okay. So with this preamble, let me briefly discuss what is friction. Okay. So what is uh, friction simply is what we know is if you have two surfaces that are contact with each other. Because by definition, friction only means that there is one surface, there is another surface can coming from any source. And when those two surfaces try to move past each other, okay, or actually move past each other. So note the choice of my words. Okay, they try to move, just trying to move, or they are fully moving. Okay? So these are two different categories. And as a few moments pass, we will see that what those categories mean. But what happens is that, that at the point of contact, even on day one, okay, somebody had asked me a question. Okay, you had asked me a question that if you have a point and a cylinder in contact with each other, then what is the line of action? And we saw that if there is no friction, then it is normal to the surface of the cylinder. But if there is friction in normal forces that we have been looking at till now, what we also have is the friction, uh, friction force which is parallel to the surface. Now this type of friction okay, is called as drive friction. Okay, the bottom we are going to discuss. So the friction can be of infinite types. And there's an entire branch called as tribology. Okay, which is dedicated to understand how surfaces interact with each other okay, and make more and more detailed studies. But what we are going to do in this class, in this lecture, is a very, very simple version of this friction, which is called as Coulombic friction or dry friction. Now, in this case, what we see is that, that there are two types of friction, static friction and kinetic friction. What that is, is let me briefly discuss here. Okay. I will not take too long, okay? Within five minutes, we will move on to the problems, which is essentially of interest to all of us. So force of frictions, okay? So just look at this block. On this block, suppose there is a weight acting on the, uh, the block has some weight, which will produce a normal reaction from this surface. In addition, suppose we are trying to pull the block with an applied force, F app. Now what we see is that, just look at this. This is force of friction, this is force R. If applied force is zero, then if we draw the free body diagram of this block, you will immediately see that the re resultant horizontal force is also zero, clearly. Now you start increasing F applied, and you will see that to balance or to keep this block in equilibrium, F will be equal to F applied till some certain value. And when it reaches this value, which is given by mu s, mu s is, is, is the coefficient of static friction, s clearly for static, n is the normal reaction, which in this case will be simply weight, and only at that point, what we say is that, that the friction bearing capacity is up to the maximum. That the surface can provide you a reaction, okay, and horizontal reaction to balance the applied force. But beyond that applied force, okay, the, the surface says that, okay, I'm done. This is the max I can do. And the body goes into an impending motion. Impending motion, when I say impending motion, it means the body just tries to move, or there is just a bare minimum relative sliding between the two surfaces. And now we know, okay, then you push even more, then actually what is seen is that, that the body cannot take too much force, okay? Uh, uh, when the body actually starts to slide, not just impending. Again, I use the word impending to mean that the body is just about to slide. The body moves into actual sliding. And in that case, the law of dry friction, again, let me emphasize that this is not a universal law like Newton's law. There are many, many, many exceptions for this law. This is a simple model. And what is seen is that, that there are many engineering problems for which this model works reasonably well. And that's the only reason that we solve many problems of this type. Otherwise, nothing. Okay, this is not a universal law. But as far as this course is concerned, we can say that there is an ample quantity of engineering problems where these uh, properties are reasonably obeyed. So force matches up with the applied force. Maximum force, mu s times n, n is a normal reaction. Then there's a dip if you apply, if you try to push even more. And then if there's a relative, there is a finite sliding. What is a finite sliding? That the body is actually relatively moving with respect to the second body. Then the force acting on it is mu k is a kinetic friction times n. And you may ask me, this is a topic of dynamics, that if I apply larger force, which is more than mu k n, then what happens? What happens is that the body accelerates. Okay, that's the only thing that happens. But let's not worry about that for the time being. What it just means is that, that if the body is moving at a finite velocity, a constant velocity, then the force, no matter what, the force of kinetic friction acting on it will be equal to mu k times n. Note one thing that by and large, okay, again, this is not a, a law of nature, but for many engineering problems, it has been seen that mu s is less than mu k. Sorry, mu s is more than mu k, pardon me, that a kinetic friction coefficient is typically smaller than the static friction coefficient. 
do you have any practical example? Okay, I will tell you one very funny example that how do we know or where does this manifest itself that mu k is less than mu s? Huh? Bicycle. Bicycle. Bicycle, okay. So the point is, is a very good example that if you want to start the bicycle, the initial rush, for example, you need to apply larger load, okay? And once it starts moving, it is easier to keep it in that place. Okay, that's one thing. The second very funny example, uh, yes? What has to apply? Cart, horse pulling the cart. Yeah, perfectly, the same thing, okay? It's a horse, it's a, it's a, so, uh, in a cycle, you are doing the function of the horse, okay? You're perfectly right, okay? It is what is happening. Now, Slipping down from Manana, okay, but there is a kinetic uh, uh, static, I don't know, okay. I think the time period of that is so short, okay. I don't know if anybody has made an experiment to figure out that is actually the, the impending friction, okay, is more than the static friction. It happens so suddenly, let's hope it doesn't happen to anyone. Yes, Fred. The old fan in railway body. Yes, so that is the example I was talking about. So nowadays, okay, all of us are distinguished people. We are pampered by the government of India. We go by flights. Okay, but in our olden days, if you remember traveling by uh, those very bad uh, coaches, you will see that the fan, you put on the switch, fan doesn't get on. So what do you do? Okay, males, they take their comb and start rotating it. And the point is that the moment it starts rotating, okay, then after it reaches some speed, it suddenly starts moving. It's almost like a miracle. Okay, but now we know, okay, not now, you also know, but now we are also expressing that it is not a miracle, it is just that kinetic friction is less than static friction. Okay, so with this preamble, okay, so let us move a little bit forward. So these are, yes, please. And the static friction. So that reason now, for example, like it's, it's very difficult because friction, I told you that tribology is this topic, which studies friction. One simple example, what people, a very hand waving reason is that initially there is some interlocking. Okay, for example, there is, a, if you see, but again, let me emphasize that this is a very, very crude example. If you look at this, you will see that there are asperities and there is an interlocking of the asperities. So the initial impending friction is to break those asperities. And when you start moving, then the point is that the asperities are broken and a different scale of asperities are now uh, coming inside. Okay, means this is a larger scale of asperity which you break and then while moving, there will be another set of asperities, okay, finer set, okay, which will intermingle with, uh, uh, intermesh with the other finer scale of asperities, okay. Again, I'm no expert on tribology, okay. So that means uh, surface is, uh, surface roughness is changing due to the motion. Uh, surface roughness is changing according to you. If okay, let me put it this way, I don't know, but what I know is, for example, there is one thing I know for sure, this was a paper in Nature a few years ago, that we use this term called smooth for surfaces and say surface is smooth, no friction, but actually it has been seen that if you make the surface super smooth at a nano scale, then there are the so-called van der Waal forces which come into play and they actually increase the friction. And the friction, for example, in this uh, simple kinetic friction, we see that friction is independent of velocity. It just depends on the normal reaction. But it has been seen at many nano scale experiments that the friction is proportional to velocity with some power law. So there are all these things happen. It's a very deep field, okay? And I maybe know maybe one by millionth of that field, okay? But the point is that for engineering problems, see engineers, for example, we don't really care what is happening. We just want some working law. We use our safety factors of two, okay? So everything is good. But what we need is some ballpark idea of what things are happening. And for most engineering problems, for the scales of interest, this works reasonably well, okay? But if you are interested, okay, we can talk, okay? You can teach me or we can look up on various sources and see what this is, okay? But one simple answer, that detailed mechanism, I don't know. Which are uh, having the relative motions. Yes. And uh, we cannot uh, make the component like a uh, highly finished. So highly? peaks and... Highly finished. Huh. So while uh, manufacturing the component, huh. so peaks and valleys are there. So yeah. They, there is some locking, interlocking between the peaks and yes. valleys. That's what so when we, when we pull the object, so that interlocking has been broken out. Hmm. So once it has been broken out, so it will move along the direction of the applied force. So okay. if, this, if this applied force exceeds the limiting condition, then it will continue along the uh, applied force directions. Okay, so that's what we were discussing, but okay, thanks for repeating it again. Okay, and uh, so let us, uh, okay, so let us, let us not go into this direction. Okay, what, why I'm saying this, we, are, we say again, the course we are doing is engineering mechanics, we are not doing tribology, so let's not get into details of that. Okay, if you have any things, again, we will come at the end of the class and discuss. Okay, I'm not saying, I'm not, uh, saying that we should not do this, do it at the end of the class, okay? These are some, uh, okay, but thanks for pointing it out.
sir depth of inter interpenetration will be more yeah no no so again time. again i'm saying okay i i think i made it amply clear should i say in other, say in other language also we will not go into details of this okay i don't see who that person is but okay who is that is okay universal message we will not go into details of micro mechanics of friction okay that's not the goal of this course yes i want to know the difference between friction and viscosity Huh. So that is viscosity is another type of friction, and the simplest viscosity, for example, if you look at the dampers, door dampers, what we know is that in door dampers, or if you have done a basic course on dynamics, we say that the resisting force is proportional to velocity. That is a major difference. Whereas in this dry friction, the force is independent of velocity. If there is a finite velocity, then the force is given by, strictly speaking, mu k velocity divided by mod of velocity. so it is only the direction of velocity that is important the magnitude is not important whereas in viscous friction it is a magnitude c times v is the actual friction force okay so i think uh, we will move on to the problem so there are many problems that we have to solve so this is what for example one point which i want to emphasize again that just because there is a friction there is a possibility of friction or there is a friction coefficient between two surfaces doesn't always mean that the friction will act okay means for example on this block if the horizontal force is zero then friction force is also zero even though the two surfaces are not smooth so friction what i want to say is that that friction is a reactive force that you apply some force and friction is a reaction to that force and that reaction will only be invoked as and when it is necessary okay so one of the common mistakes which i have seen which happens okay not that uh, this is what we emphasize to the students that it doesn't mean that if there is a no weight acting then the frictional force is always mu times w that's not true okay if there is an horizontal force then you will immediately say that if px is less than fm what is fm mu s times n okay then no motion and impending motion only when px is the horizontal force is equal to fm okay the maximum friction force which is mu s mu s times n okay on a very important point that just because there is a friction okay doesn't mean that it needs to slide just because i have like lot of money okay i don't have but if i have lot of money it doesn't mean that i need to go out and spend it okay so it just as per the requirement it's a reactive force okay it acts depending on what is the applied uh, uh, forces on the system okay and when there is a finite motion impending motion is about to slide finite motion is that it is actually finitely sliding okay then friction is equal to okay f times uh, 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 mu k times k and if px is more than that friction then the body will accelerate and not stay in a constant velocity that's the only thing there is one very uh, important concept which i want to say is very important because we will see that in many problems by just turning the argument around and representing the friction in this way problems become very simple okay even initially for example when i had just started uh, like just learning this course teaching this course in the very beginning So what will let us see what why do you take this extra representation okay so what is this representation before i say that why we do this what is that representation that at the point of contact there will be a normal reaction there will be a friction and as we had discussed in the first few classes that and we all know that the simple parallelogram law will tell that the resultant will be r in some direction and let's say that the resultant reaction r makes an angle phi with respect to the normal reaction this is a normal this is r so this has to be phi and what we know is that sim immediately that then uh, this uh, friction force okay is simply equal to okay simply equal to this reaction times sin phi and normal reaction is simply equal to n is equal to r times cos phi and what we know is because the ratio of friction and normal reaction cannot become more than mu s this angle of friction maximum value will be such that tan of phi s is equal to mu s okay that is phi will have a maximum value of phi s which is given by tan inverse of mu s very simple point okay and only when the motion is impending will this phi become equal to phi s okay so even i used to have many misgivings that okay why this representation okay you just say friction in the horizontal friction force uh, which is in a tangential direction normal force in the normal direction why this uh, representation we will see that there are many problems that if we have a representation like this okay you can drastically simplify the problem so so far so good okay so we have essentially finished our theory now we will move on to the problems but any questions before we move on to solving the problems actually yeah 
Fine. Let us move on. In this case, the point of application of the normal reaction is shifted according to the figure. So, why it's so? <laughs> it's because it's a good question. The point of application of the normal reaction in a block typically, see, as opposed to a cylinder, which has a perfect point of contact. So, the reaction can only act through that point. But if you have an extended object, like a block, as shown here, then the normal the effective reaction, the statically equivalent reaction can have any action. And the action, the line of action will be such, okay, it will adjust in such a way that the torque or the moment which is created by all these forces get ultimately balanced. So the line of reaction can shift depending on what is the height at which you apply. We will solve a problem. Depending on how much is the magnitude, the line of reaction can clearly shift. So that's why, for example, when you are solving equilibrium of just 2D of bodies, which are have a finite contact, not a point contact, we don't write three, three equations of equilibrium, we write only two equations of equilibrium, because third equation will only give you the line of action. We'll discuss many such problems here, okay? It's a good question, that the line of contact will change, why? Because depending on the applied force, the line of action of the force, the moment has to be balanced, and the line of reaction will shift, okay, in order to balance that moment. Fine? Okay, some jokes, okay, we'll have time later on, okay. So, what we'll do is that, the friction problems, okay, by and large, okay, again, say this is not, for example, a taxonomical categorization, okay, it's not a hard and fast that, like this will only go into this section, other will only go into this section, but typically, that friction co problems, we can classify it into some simple uh, cases, okay, we have some three or four classification, Okay, their empirical classification, you may either add or subtract from them at the end of this class. So after like discussing with many students, uh, our co colleagues reading Beer and Johnston, we, we realize, okay, that uh, typically we can invoke laws of friction in different ways. So problem type one, okay, let us call it one for uh, the lack of any fancy term. It's like a usual equilibrium problem, whatever we have done in the class till now. So we have to just solve those problems Okay, like we have done all these problems, okay, with a, with a, without even thinking about friction. And then what we do is the problem statement is such that you will be asked that verify if a particular surface is capable of handling that load. What does that mean? Is that at that particular surface, the uh, friction divided by normal reaction should be less than or equal to mu. Okay, or find out the minimum coefficient of friction required or given the slipping of occurs at the, any surface, find the friction coefficient. So in these problems, the important thing is that, that the friction law, okay, that the, any invocation of the Coulomb's friction law, that the impending motion implies that the friction is equal to mu times n, needs to be invoked at the very end. Till then, the problem is like any normal problem. What we have done in the class two days ago. And we'll do that, okay, with a simple example. So what we have in this example, is these are what are called as friction tongs, okay? So in this friction tongs, what is being done is that, that suppose there is, a, there is a block which is resting on the ground and you want to lift it up, okay, using the tongs. Suppose, for example, this is a hot metal block, you don't want to touch it, so these tongs are used to lift up that block. Now, how does this mechanism work? The mechanism works is that, that you bring these tongs from your house, okay, if you have it, okay, of course, you bring it, there will be some weight for that tongue, okay? Now you go and put these jaws at point D and D prime, okay? Now on the top, try to lift it. Because of the self weight of the tongue, these jaws will try to close. And when they close, they exert a normal reaction. Now when you try to lift it, the normal reaction will increase, friction will increase. And when you try it lifting more and more, okay, it's a self-feeding mechanism where the normal reaction keeps increasing, friction keeps increasing till you lift that block up completely from the ground. Okay, so that's the overall mechanism. It's a self-locking mechanism that you just put that in, the weight will do the initial job, keep lifting, 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 okay? It will clamp on it and ultimately lift that block. Now what we are asked in this problem that all the dimensions are given to us. Okay, all the dimensions of the problems are given to us, all the weights, okay, this 750 is much larger than the, suppose, the weight of the tongs. Uh, uh, and what we are asked to do is we are asked to find out that at, there are two contact surfaces of the tongs with this block at D and D prime, and we are asked to find out that what is the smallest allowable value of coefficient of static friction between the casting, this, 
and the blocks d and d prime okay that what is the minimum coefficient of friction that is required here and at this point such that we can lift it off without the block falling down problem statement clear the mechanism approx uh, mechanism clear okay now tell me how will we solve this problem can we solve this problem first of all what we need essentially what we are asked we are asked to find out what is the minimum coefficient of friction at d and d prime what does that mean that at the point of contact f the friction force divided by the normal reaction generated okay whatever those re values are unka ratio will be the minimum coefficient of friction now the question we ask is that that without invoking a friction law can we get those quantities beforehand just think about it can we or can't we if you lift this if you lift this block what will be the, the tension in this string if you are lifting this by a string at the top what will be the force you need to exert on this string equal to weight equal to weight and for moment equilibrium that weight and the string should exactly be in the same line like we did the problem a couple of days ago so one question is solved now if i know what is the vertical force acting at joint a what are ba and ab ba and ab prime what kind of members are they there are two force members can we find out what is the force in those two members immediately we can take joint a okay great you also got the answer okay so we immediately know that what are the forces in them by taking joint equilibrium of a in the vertical direction by symmetry or by equilibrium in the horizontal direction both the both the forces are same now we get what is the force at b we also know the direction now how do we get what is the normal reaction at d and what is the friction at d can you tell me what will be the friction at d 375 perfect so how do we get that 375 if you take the equilibrium of this small block here then by symmetry the friction force which is acting upwards now friction force has to act upward here will be equal to how much this the 750 divided by 2 so we also get a friction force here now what we need is a normal reaction how do we get a normal reaction we will take just this free body diagram say bcd okay yeah and take moment about c we will immediately get the normal reaction so we have not used friction till now at all what we have done is that we have just simple do done simple 2d equilibrium and only at the end we get the friction force also which is 375 we can find out the normal reaction and what we say is that the minimum coefficient of friction will be just f by n and any friction coefficient which is higher than that the 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 tongs will be functional point clear so nowhere are we using friction so these are the type of problems where friction comes at the very end is the idea clear fine okay so this is the solution you can solve it and uh, this is the coefficient of friction comes out to be 0.19 all the procedure exactly as many of you suggested let us do this problem okay suppose in this problem what is given is that that a bicyclist pedals the bike up a slope so there is a small slope which is given to you 5 by 100 gradient the bicyclist is moving at a constant speed the speed is constant and what we are given is the combined weight of the bicyclist and the cycle it passes through point g whose coordinate is also given it's 460 perpendicular to, uh, along the direction of the slope the wheel dimensions are given the spacing between the center of the wheels is also given and what we are asked to do here that if the rear wheel this wheel at the back is on the verge of slipping determine the coefficient of friction mu s between the rear tire and the road that is the first part of the question the second part of the question is is the coefficient of friction is doubled what will be the force acting on the rear wheel okay now can we so now the only difference in this problem is that that the bicyclist is moving at a constant speed but what we know is that even if an object is moving at a constant speed okay all the forces all the torques should be balanced on that okay we know that also okay because we just change our reference frame okay and we see that the bike uh, and uh, we will see that the bicyclist is stationary in that inertial frame 
So all the equilibrium laws which, are, which we have used till now are equally valid. Now let us discuss that how do we solve this problem? How do we get that coefficient of friction? How many unknowns do we have? And can we get all those unknowns? On the front wheel, how many unknowns will we have? For front wheel, traction force is not needed. Traction force means? Uh, driving force. Okay, okay sir. driving force is not needed. Yes, Actually, so what is the conclusion? Rolling only. Excuse me. Huh? It is under pure rolling. That is fine, but my question is simple. My question is that, is there a friction force on the front wheel or not? Yes, definitely, friction? sir. Okay, then somebody said no. I want to hear from that person. Somebody said no, right? Or from this side, I heard no. Friction is under the rear wheel, wheel, but can you tell me the justification that why on the front wheel, there will be no friction? I agree with you, okay? In fact, I have to tell that I agree with uh, this that, person that's here. That's the impending case, sir. Huh? The motion is impending in the rear wheel only. Suppose if it is not impending. You have some something to write. I want to hear that logic. I could not describe it clearly. Hello. <coughs> sir, that sir, it is rolling. Wait a second. It is Wait a second. Rear wheel only. You think it is like that. Okay, that's your logic. Okay. Now, now, sir, now you tell somebody interrupt. Wheel is rolling, sir. sir. Actually, to roll a body, there, there must be a torque. And for that, uh, this T, uh, which is torque, it must be balanced by the force. Which so force? there must be friction uh, over the uh, rear wheel. Excuse okay. Yes, sir. please. Okay. One sir. last. Okay. Then I will move on to the what my version of the sir. events is. Sir. Without okay. friction, it cannot Start roll. Witness. Okay. Then I will move on to my version. Sir. Sir, wheel is. Yes. So you think will there be a friction on the front wheel or not? No. No. Good. Okay. So the idea is this: if we assume that the axles are well lubricated, again as usual. Okay. If the axles are rusty, then all bits are off. But if the axles are well lubricated, and note that this entire bike is moving at a constant speed, which also implies that if there is, the, which also implies that the wheels, okay, are also moving at a constant angular velocity. Okay, now, if we draw the free body diagram of the front wheel, as many of you pointed out that there is no driving torque. Front wheel is a free wheeling, it's a, it's a free wheeling uh, uh, cylinder, because of which what is happening is that, and there is no, because the axle is well lubricated, as we saw in the case of pulley, there can be only two reactions, horizontal reaction and vertical reaction, but no torque. If it is not well lubricated, then again this is wrong. But assuming it is well lubricated, okay, which we hope we keep our bicycles, then there is no torque here. Then if we assume that there is some friction which is acting here, then all these three forces, they meet at the center, so the friction will create a torque at the center which means that the wheel cannot rotate at a constant angular velocity, which is contradicting the given statement of the problem. Which means that, for example, for that particular state where everything is moving at a constant speed, there cannot be torque, or there cannot be uh, friction on the front wheel because it will create a torque at the center, and it contradicts what we are seeing, okay, or what is given to us in the problem. So if the condition is maintained like this, then there is no friction force on the front wheel. Huh? No, no, but then, no, no, no. Because we are doing an approximation here that it's a point friction. But what we see clearly is that the wheel is not a point contact. It's a very simple approximation. Wheel, if you see, it always flattens out. It is not really remaining a point. Okay, so then you have to use different ideas in that. But it's a simple course to the first order. Okay, to the first correction, uh, to the most basic degree of understanding, okay, the friction fields force will not be as dominant on the front wheel as on the back wheel. Let me put it this way. Actually, cases, there will be friction. Yes, of course there will be. Because the wheel will not have a point contact. Those are called a rolling friction. Yeah. Now, okay, so front wheel doesn't have, the front wheel only has a normal reaction. Now, at the back wheel, there can be a friction. Why there can be a friction? Because the chain is connected to a wheel at the back. Okay, I don't recall the name for that. Oh. And we are, huh? Sprocket. Sprocket. Sprocket? Okay, yeah, good. Okay, so that is connected to the rear wheel and when we pedal, we are exerting a torque on the rear wheel. And that torque has to be balanced by the friction that is provided at the rear wheel. So there has to be friction at the rear wheel. And now if you take the full free body diagram, then what you realize is that, that is, the biker is moving up, there is a slope. So there will be a component of the reaction along the plane. So that friction will balance the component of the, of the weight along the slope. So what we see here is that, so essentially that is also telling us that when we are biking, we are creating that friction by the pedaling 
And that friction in turn is essentially making sure that, for example, it is balancing the, the reaction of the weight along the direction of the slope. Now essentially what do we have? We just have three reactions, three unknowns. We can immediately find out what is the normal reaction by taking the torque for the full cycle about point A. How do we know RBX? By balancing the react forces along the slope. So we know RBX, we know RBY. And we take the ratio of them at the very end of the problem, okay? And we say that because it is given that a wheel is on the verge of slipping, that ratio should be equal to the coefficient of friction between the rear wheel and the surface. And now this entire solution procedure immediately makes it clear that if you double the friction, what happens? Anything changes? If you double the friction now, does anything in the problem changes? Only change that will happen is that now the wheel will not have impending slippage. That is the only thing that will happen. Okay? So now these are the point of problems where, for example, what we do is we keep track of how many unknowns are there in the system, how many equations we can have from the number of free body diagrams. And if they to match, then only at the end, for example, we'll be asked that is the motion impending, what is the minimum friction, and so on. So these are essentially simple problems like what we had done earlier. Only friction is invoked at the very end of solving the problem. Is the, is the overall idea clear? Fine? Okay? Because, because what happens is that typically, I have seen that, for example, that in many students there is a quick tendency that friction, okay, suddenly you just put everywhere mu s times n. Okay, so that's not the idea. That we just have to figure out what is happening, what are the unknowns acting at every point. Can we get all those unknowns without invoking the friction law? We, we, have, we should invoke the friction that mu s times n only at the very end if we can help it. That is the experience. Because otherwise, if you just put it somewhere, then there is no way to track that because if you put all those arrows, put mu s times n, and at the end, okay, you realize, okay, that it was not sliding there. But then all the job is done. You will completely lose track of the bookkeeping, and the problem will be a mess. So as far as possible, one of the, the rules of thumb is that you try to invoke the friction law only as late as possible. Okay? So that is one of the observations. So can we move on to the next type or the next class of problems? Okay, very simple problem. Here I have to, uh, this problem is a very simple problem, is there for a reason. Okay, that for example, in many friction problems, for example, you may be asked that what should be the maximum, what should be the inclination, what is the maximum value of x, so as is given in this problem. So what we are asked here is we have a vertical mass which is guided by rollers in this slot. And we want to keep this mass in equilibrium by putting a stick AB such that there is a friction between B and the surface and the same uh, and friction between A and the surface. What is given is that the coefficient of static friction is 0.3 at the upper end of the bar and 0.4 at the lower end of the bar. Okay? Find the friction force acting on each end for x equal to 75 millimeter. Also find the maximum value of x for which the bar will not slip. So two parts of the question. So can you, can you tell me how do we solve this problem? Is the problem statement clear? First problem is that, that a coefficient of friction is 0.3 at the upper end of the bar and 0.4 at the lower end of the bar. And if this x value, okay, the length is 300, this x is the horizontal distance given, okay, find the friction force acting on each end of the bar at B and at A. And second part is find the maximum value of x for which the bar will not slip. How do we solve this problem? If we neglect the weight of this bar AB, okay, suppose because this is 60 kg, hopefully the weight of this will be far low, okay, what is AB? It's a two-force member. What will be the direction along which the, uh, the reaction, the total reaction at A will act? Along AB? Yes, two-force member? It's a two force member, okay? What about the reaction at B? It will be along BA. So it has to be a compressive force clearly in this case. So the reactions will act like this, okay? Now what do we know about the normal reaction that is provided at B? No, no at, 
point B, what will be the vertical reaction? 16 to? 15 to? Huh? 15 to G. Or just you can say 50 kg if you want to stick with kg units. So 50 G, or if you take G equal to 10, it will be 500 Newton, will be the force which will, normal reaction which will act at B. Now can you immediately find out what is friction at, uh, what is the friction force here? Just, no, 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 no. That's what I'm saying. 0 0.3 is the value of friction. But in this case, we know that it's a two force member. We also know that for that two force member at point B, what is the vertical component of the, free, of the force? It is equal to 50 into 10 or 500 kilonewton. And if we know the direction, then immediately we can find out what is the horizontal force. Yes? We don't need to invoke friction here. You see the point? Okay, most of you, but if not, okay, please uh, see that point. You can't say 0.3 into that. But what you do now is you find out the value of friction, okay? How do you know that it will slip or not slip? Is it the entire assembly stable or not stable? Five hundred sine theta. That's fine. Where theta is where? Theta is this. Uh, no, not five hundred sine theta. Five hundred tan theta. Okay. <laughs> no, no. What are we talking here now? Yeah. Member force is fine, but we are asked to find the friction force. Okay. Fine. So, okay. So you do that. But now my question to you is this: that you can find out the friction force. Why? Because this force ka line of action is along BA. Normal reaction is five hundred newton. So friction force will be just this, uh, so the ratio of friction by normal will be just equal to how much? The, the, the angle, this angle is how much? This angle will be 75 divided by 300, sine inverse of that. Okay? So tan, uh, so 500 into tan of that angle will be the friction force. Fine, great. But now what I'm asking is that, okay, good. What I'm asking is that ki we also have to verify that the, for that system to be in equilibrium, it should provide that much force. But the coefficient of frictions are given. If the coefficient of friction is zero at point B, this assembly is not stable. Right? This assembly is not stable. But on the other hand, we are given that the coefficient of static friction is 0.3 at the upper end, 0.4 at the lower end. So what should we how what should we compare? A B, if I if I just draw it here, let me just go here. This is the reaction that is provided. Okay. This alpha or this alpha cannot be more than the phi max or phi s, which is tan inverse of mu at this contact and similarly for this contact. See the point? Yes, no, just tell me, yes or no? Fine. So then we just verify that if that angle, this resulting angle, okay, if this angle, because the minimum friction now here is what, 0 0.3. And the angle is same both at A and B. So we have to verify that this angle is less than tan inverse of 0 0.3. If it is less, you are good. The assembly is stable. If not, the assembly is unstable. And the second part of the question is that find the maximum value of x for which the bar will not slip. So what do we do in that case? We see that if we increase this angle, then x will keep increasing. But we cannot increase this angle beyond tan inverse of 0.3. So we take this angle to be tan inverse of 0.3 and x will be equal to 300 sine of that angle. Okay, you immediately get what is the value. So what we have done is that strictly speaking, this system, you don't need to worry about the friction problem. Only at the end, to check the stability of the assembly, Okay, we need to invoke friction saying that at all the forces, we could obtain all the forces, but we just need to verify that the forces are such that the angle of friction is less than uh, phi s or f divided by n is less than mu s. Both are equivalent. Is the idea fine? Okay. Now, we'll come to another interesting category of problem that in these type of problems, what we know is that, that the number of equations, okay, if we write the, all the equations for the free body diagrams, is less than the number of unknowns in the system. Okay? Now, in this case, this problem is a statically indeterminate problem. 
So the problems in this category are defined in such a way that you are asked to find out that what is the range of force that I should apply since the entire assembly is in equilibrium or what should be the range of angles or what should be the range of distances over which the system should be spread such that the entire assembly is in equilibrium, okay? So now, these category of problems, okay, we have to be very careful, okay, because now we need to invoke the law of uh, friction, mu s times n, very early, as compared to the category one problems, where the friction has to be invoked only at the very end, otherwise it was like a 2D equilibrium problem, okay? So, the idea is always to keep track of the number of unknowns that, that are present in the system, and the number of equations that are present in the system. So let us move on to this problem, okay? What we have in this case is two inclined blocks, okay? 15 degree angle, block A, block B. The coefficient of static friction between this is 0.4, static friction 0.4 between this. Now these two blocks are connected by a string AB. And look carefully what is the definition of this problem. The, the definition of this problem states that what is the force P that you should apply to this system for which the motion of the 30 kg block, okay, this block is impending. Or sometimes you may rephrase the problem in a different way that what is the minimum pulling force you should apply to this block so that this entire assembly is no longer in equilibrium. Okay, you can rephrase it in another way. Now note that in this case, how many unknowns are present? One, two, string. There are two unknown reactions here. Three, four, two unknown reactions here. Okay, so four, five, six. So there are six unknowns. And how many equations of equilibrium we have? We have four, why? Because as one gentleman asked us before, that there is a line of action which is also an unknown, so we don't take care of that. So because it's an extended contact, note, it's an extended contact, so the line of the effective force is also an unknown. But we don't worry about that, why? Because for this problem, for finding P is concerned, that line of action is immaterial, okay? What we assume is that the body is not toppling and that reaction, line of reaction will come, come somewhere. We only want to find out that what are the forces. So as far as the top block is concerned, we have two equations. Bottom block, we have two equations. So we have four equations and six unknowns. So we are in trouble. So four equations, six unknowns, we need two extra equations. And those two extra equations are going to come from impending friction, where we are going to invoke that the friction force is given go, is equal to mu s times n. Okay, then if you invoke those two equations, then the number of equations, number of unknowns will become the same. But now how do we invoke them? Okay, suppose this string were not present. Okay, if this string were not present, then what happens? Is that assembly in equilibrium? No string present, no P present, just two blocks lying one on top of each other. Is that entire assembly in equilibrium? No. Why not? May or may not be, that's a very good question. Okay, that's a very good reply. May or may not be. Okay, how do you verify that it's in equilibrium or not in equilibrium? That's a very good point. Okay, may or may not be. But how do we decide that it is not or yes? Angle of angle. So what we need to know is that tan 15, okay, should be, should be less than mu s. In this case, it will be true. Tan of 15 degrees, you can quickly type in your calculator, you will see that it's less than 0.4. So just those two are in equilibrium, okay? Now, let us come back to our original problem, okay? Let's say that if there is a string that is attached. Now, how do we create an impending motion for this block? Now note, that that's the beauty of uh, this kinematics and dynamics. If there's an impending motion of this block B in the right direction, okay? What happens to block A? Will it just remain there or will it also move? It will move up or down? Up or down, because now what is happening that this string is of constant length. When you pull this block in this side, there is extra string that is pulled from the top. So block A will move up, block B will move sideways. So what is happening is that that impending motion of block A is immediately causing impending motion of block B. So it's a consistent that for example, we needed two extra equations and the kinematics of the problem is telling us that when block B is impending, block A is impending, sorry, when block B is impending, A also becomes impending, which is automatic. 
Now the only thing that you need to do is to figure out what are the directions of friction forces, which are now very important, which you have to invoke very at the very beginning, not at the very end as we did before. Now if the motion of block B is impending, okay, in the right direction, what is the, what is the direction of friction acting on block B? In the opposite direction, okay, right, left, okay, okay, opposite, okay, because like I see from this side, okay. So the impending motion of block B is this way, the friction will act in the opposite direction, okay, on one surface. Now at, at surface A, now here in these problems, you need to be very careful that the kinematics of the problem should dictate what is the sign, okay, as opposed to for example the other problems in equilibrium, where sign you take whatever and you are still good because automatically the negative sign will come. But here, there is an interplay between the kinematics and the forces. So because of that, we have to be very careful about what the sign is. So if the block B moves upwards, there is a relative sliding like this. So what should be the direction of friction acting on block uh, A? Downwards? Downwards? And, and the friction which is what, what block A acts on block B will be again how much? Upwards, equal and opposite. That's it. You are done. So now the number of unknowns are normal reaction, friction is mu s times n. Normal reaction, friction of mu s times n, just draw the appropriate free body diagrams and you will immediately find out, okay, what is P or for example, a solution procedure is briefly given here, okay. You can just follow that solution procedure or you can think about it that what is the, you, the easiest thing to do is as far as the top block is concerned, you can have a x and y axis which is along the direction of the plane. As far as the block 2 is concerned, you can have x and y axis which are in the normal direction, okay, like horizontal and vertical. Just solve these two and within like few lines, you can find out what is the value of P. Is the procedure clear? So see how beautiful it is that you track the number of equations, number of unknowns and the kinematics of the problem will also conspire in such a way that whatever your mathematical uh, requirements will automatically be satisfied by the kinematics that you needed two extra slippages to solve this problem and kinematics guaranteed that you got two slippages, okay? So is this fine? So now note that this problem is very different than the problem we solved a few moments ago where we had to invoke friction at the very end. And in fact, even if you screw the direction of friction, you can automatically adjust it afterwards in those problems. But here, you cannot screw the direction of friction. The physical meaning of the problem just completely changes. And the, the direction of frictions will be purely governed by how the impending motions can be seen. Is this point clear? Okay, any doubts, any questions? Fine, okay, so this is category type two problem, okay? Um, one, we will solve one more problem of this type in the tutorial, okay? We, we will, you will solve it and uh, I will just supervise. Uh, problem number three is again, the, the rule of thumb and the most important rule of thumb, okay, is that it's these type of problems are very similar to problem type two, okay, very similar. But what is different is that uh, the total number of uh, extra equations that you need, means for example, you get a certain number of equations, certain number of free bodies, which will provide you a certain number of equations. There will be a certain number of unknowns. And if those unknowns, in this case also, will be more than the number of equations, so you need to invoke friction. But what will happen in these kind of problems is that the contact surfaces will be more than the number of slippages that you require. So because of that, there can be different ways in which the body can go into non-equilibrium or for example, it can lose this mechanical equilibrium. So we have to now decide that for these kind of problems, where will the slippage occur? Okay, you cannot just immediately say that a slippage happens at all contact points. Okay, and one type of problem, okay, we'll discuss here. So what we have here, okay, and whatever I said, if it was not already clear, will become clear when we solve this problem. So what we have here, is a block AB, there is a coefficient of friction mu s at the point of contact between A and B. Note that this is a point contact. So there is a small cylinder, so there is a point contact here or a contact over a very small area. So we know immediately what is the line of action of the force, okay, that point of action of the force, it is here. As opposed to this problem where this line or this point of action is not clear, in this case, we immediately know that the force friction or normal will only act at point B. Now this AB bar has a roller which is pinned at its end A 
and it is leaning against a mass m naught which is in contact with the vertical okay which with the vertical wall and what we are asked here is this we are asked in this problem that this mass is given okay what should be the range of theta so this angle theta that what should be the range of theta such that this entire assembly is in equilibrium okay so is the problem clear that everything is given and you are asked to find out that those theta what is the range of those such that this entire assembly remains in equilibrium problem clear or any ambiguity about the problem statement yes okay so i take it that the problem is clear so can you tell uh, first of all before doing anything let us count the number of equations and number of unknowns for this vertical mass how many unknowns two normal reaction friction point of contact roller three point b four five two unknowns friction normal reaction and angle theta so there are six unknowns in this problem how many free body diagrams two free body diagrams how many equations i can write for this for this block not extended contact line of action point of action not known so only two we can write only two equations for this and three for this so we have six unknowns and we have five equations so we need one extra equation and that extra equation has to come from impending slippage at some point but how many surfaces do we have no this is a frictionless surface you don't care here we have one and two we have two surfaces okay we have two surfaces but how many unknowns how many extra equations we need mathematically just one so the most bone headed way of doing is immediately say that there is a friction uh, is equal to mu times n mu times n but then you will have a over determined problem so what we need is we need slip only at one surface now does that give you an inkling of why do we need a range of theta okay that the friction okay that's the slippage we need only at one surface but we have two now how do we decide okay then we come to the statement of the problem what we are asked is that what is the range of theta for which this assembly is in equilibrium so think about it like this if theta is extremely small what happens let's say theta is very small the rod is almost vertical let's say theta is zero in the extreme case okay we can always use extremes because that gives us insight if theta is zero what happens to this assembly there is no normal reaction that will act on this mass okay but there is a weight so friction is taking care of the weight so the the top mass will topple down take second example where this ab is very horizontal okay it's like it's a, a that this angle is uh, this angle is very large okay it will fall down it cannot take this friction cannot be taken care of okay this friction cannot be taken care of so it will fall down okay why because the normal reaction will keep increasing with this angle okay and the friction will not be capable of taking care of that so the rod will slip down so what we know immediately from this simple analysis that very large small theta top mass will slip large theta the rod will slide so what do we want the range is required such that even this does not come down the rod does not slide so that is the range but that also immediately tells us that for small theta okay the 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 boundary line of equilibrium okay the boundary line that the system is in stable configuration is when the motion is impending anything beyond that the system will collapse okay so what do we do first we say that when theta is small then the, we find out that for what theta we get impending motion here and then we increase theta and say that what theta we get the impending motion here and those two different mechanism that in one mechanism the system fails by this in second mechanism the system fails by this and we want this limit where the system stays in equilibrium so we look for one range here where the system is in impending motion here the second limit of theta where the system is in impending motion at the end is the logic clear okay so we don't for example it's again a problem where the number of equations is less than the number of unknowns but still we cannot directly invoke friction now at all surfaces we have to figure out 
that where is that slippage indeed going to happen and we use all manner of all possible logic at our disposal to figure that out. Okay, now if you just quickly have, is, is, the, is the idea clear? Okay, that why in this case, and in this case we get a range. There's a range of theta. Okay, what is, what, what is happening here? And the mechanism is that one theta, this falls down, other theta, this slips out. And a simple way to do it is you can take the top free body diagram, normal reaction, this F1 should be equal to M0 G for equilibrium of this mass and N1 should be equal to RA. Take the second rod free body diagram. What we need to know, what we know is by taking torque about point B or moment about point B, we immediately find out RA which will equal to Mg by 2 times theta. And as we had rightly suspected that when theta increases, RA increases, okay? And N2 will be equal to Mg. So this is the F2 will be equal to RA. So friction force is equal to this, normal reaction, okay, is equal to Mg. And in the first case, okay, when theta is a reasonably small value, we want slippage here. So we immediately know that the first case of slippage is such that F1 by N1, okay, so for the entire assembly to be in equilibrium, we want F1 by N1 to be less than or equal to mu s. From that, okay, this is the expression we get for F1 by N1. We can find out what is the lowest limit on tan theta or on theta from the second ratio F2 by N2. Okay, this is the F2 by N2 ratio, which will come out to be this quantity. We will get what is the largest limit on theta and your real theta should be within these limits. That when your theta is between these two values, your system will stay. If your theta becomes smaller than this value, the top block will slide. If your theta becomes larger than this value, this will slide at B. Is the idea clear? And then you ask yourself a question, okay, suppose, okay, in a hypothetical scenario, where this angle is actually more than this angle. Means, in other words, if this quantity, look here, this quantity is more than this quantity, then what will happen? It's a question for you. If, for example, if this quantity is less than 2 mu s, then we can get a nice limit on theta where the system is in equilibrium. But if it so happens that the dimensions of the system are such, the weights of the components are such, that this quantity becomes more than or equal to 2 mu s. It will never be in equilibrium. This will either slip here or slip there. Okay, you can never maintain both surfaces in equilibrium. Okay, so is the logic clear for this problem? Like these type of problems, the, pro the category type three, or it's a category we have created, you can always um, make it A, B, C, or whatever, whatever suits you. Okay, but this is just for our uh, understanding so that we, we can break it into various parts and then decide that what is the logic we are going to use to attack that particular problem.